South Carolina's six venomous snakes coming up. Fangs in your face. Subscribe now. What's up, Venom Squad? Hey, today we are doing an educational video, okay? But this was kind of an important one um, because I'm getting ready to start my my training program with first responders and different things. And, and this video is about our six native venomous snakes that reside right here in South Carolina. Okay, and we're gonna go through all of them and talk a little bit about them, talk a little bit about the venom, and just try to educate you all about our native venomous snakes. Today, we're gonna learn some things. Hey, Venom Squad, before we get started, I wanna give a special thank you to Paul Breslin. He actually stepped up and sponsored the whole exhibit build for Maximus, our monster Mexican West Coast rattlesnake. Paul, thank you so much, brother. And I wanna say a special thank you to my brother, Diego. Diego has been a big time supporter of this channel from the beginning. Thank you so much, Diego. Diego sponsored the Rhino Viper exit build. It's gonna be beautiful. I can't wait till it's done. Hey, thank you to everybody that has supported us and contributed to the Serpent Center. We're gonna give you a quick run around of our space for the exhibit room. And it's, it's a big space, so we wanted this quick show to you and show you all the work we've accomplished. And we're like this far away from getting our exhibits brought in. So hang in there, we're gonna give you a quick tour of the exhibit room space. Just a quick view, guys, of our space for our exhibit room. Um, you can see it's, it's, it's pretty spacious. I mean, we're gonna be able to literally have 10 to 15 um, eight foot long, four foot high exhibits in here, along with another 24 four foot long and two foot high exhibits. You know, and not only will the wall space be covered in exhibits, we've got this big monster center space. We're gonna have a couple islands with some like view from both sides exhibit type things, you know. Um, we don't know what's gonna go in the middle yet, but we've kind of got it mapped out what we want for the beginning, for phase one of the build. I mean, we're hoping to have at least 50 to 60 exhibits in this in this whole space by the time it's all said and done. But like this wall will be completely covered in eight foot exhibits. And this is gonna be our our appreciation wall, our donator appreciation wall with people that bought bricks and things like that. You see, we still got tools and ladders and stuff everywhere. I mean, we're working on this every day. And then you can see we still got work to do on this wall. This wall here, we still got to do some sanding, and then we're down to our final run of painting. So we're down to painting, and then our exhibits get delivered. But we got this huge space for all of this, and it's, it's gonna be awesome. We cannot wait to open it. It's work in progress, but we're at the home stretch. As soon as we get this paint on the walls, the exhibits are in, and we're off and running. But I'll tell you, I would rather wrestle a damn black mamba than paint. I hate painting. <laughs> Dina loves it. I hate it. But, you know, we've done all this, just, just me and the wife, you know, the whole building, all the work is just me and Dina, you know, just putting in good old elbow grease and blood, sweat, and tears. We're hoping to have our exhibits in, installed in the next week and a half, two weeks tops. And uh, then we just start filling with snakes and designing the exhibits and making it beautiful. We cannot wait to see you guys here. Um, we cannot wait to open the Serpent Center. I mean, this, this will be the heartbeat of the Serpent Center. Just to give you guys a quick look around at all of the stuff that's going on so our generous contributors can see how much we've accomplished. Can't wait to see y'all here. <laughs> hey, and thank you to everybody that has contributed to the Serpent Center. And we are on our way. We are literally almost there and we could not thank everybody enough. We truly and deeply appreciate everybody's help with this. Our native venomous snakes here in South Carolina. Uh, you know, we have a reptile rich environment here where we live. And for what I do, I mean, doing the training and, 
and educating people about venomous snakes is important because I'll tell you something, bite statistics for venomous snakes here in South Carolina, they increase every year anywhere from 20 to 30%. And a lot of the bites are attributed to actually what we call legitimate bites, okay? They're, they, they, they happen out in the wild. They're not happening from handlers or keepers or private collectors. They're, they're legitimate bites. To be truthful, most of the time, a bite happens when somebody's fooling with a snake out in the wild or, or trying to catch it or, or, or prodding at it or just messing with it and they end up getting bit. Um, just a quick run through. As you can see, the venomous snakes of South Carolina, we have our keystrodon species, we have our cottonmouth, okay? Or AKA water moccasin. And of course, we have our copperhead and we have our timber rattlesnake or AKA, which I like to call it the canebrake rattlesnake. And we got our Eastern Diamondback, which we do have Eastern Diamondbacks here in South Carolina. We'll talk about that in a minute. But also our little pygmy rattlesnake and the coral snake. With native species, some are very, very prolific. And bites that happen, 90% of the time, they are from a copperhead or a cottonmouth. They're really prolific and there's a lot of them. And they're able to survive in a lot of different environments. So. Most of your bites are attributed to the keystrodon, but the rattlesnake bites are serious. And so there's a lot to talk about. We're gonna start out today with one of the most important ones, okay? We're gonna start out with the timber rattlesnake, the AKA canebrake rattlesnake. Okay, and the first snake on our list of venomous snakes of South Carolina, we're gonna start out with the timber rattlesnake or the canebrake rattlesnake. Now this is an adult male and they get much larger than this. We've had some monsters here in the past. This is an important one. And this one you wanna pay attention to, especially if you're a South Carolina resident, okay? Now, formerly the canebrake was a subspecies of timber rattlesnake, but it's not no more. They're all classified the same. They're all Crolus horridus. According to DNA, they have the same DNA strain. But I was a big believer in the subspecies thing for, for many years, and I kind of still am because I have, I've found hundreds of these in the wild. I found hundreds of northern timbers, which I call the true mountain timbers um, in the wild. I've filmed them, I've studied them for many years, and I always stuck to cane break should be a subspecies. Hey y'all, Willie Venom Central. Hey, I'm out in the field today. Check out this guy. What a smoker. So nice big adult male cane break, timber rattlesnake, aka cane break. Somebody enlightened me here recently. <laughs> I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> if you think about it this way, I was having a conversation with Dina earlier and, and she says, you know, you think about it, just like snakes with sex, sexual dimorphism, males and females of the same species, of the same everything, can look totally different. I go, you know what? And it triggered something in me. That, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense, you know, because you can have snakes that are look totally different and be the same species, male and female, and they're just sexually dimorphic. And with the timber or cane break, which I still use cane breaks, cane breaks, I mean, they look quite a bit different from, from other timbers. I mean, they're they're larger, their body structure is a little bit different, their coloring is a little different, but the DNA strand is the same. So they are the same animal, but I believe that evolution spread these snakes out enough to where they evolved to adapt to their habitat, okay? But to get back to things a little more important, now, this snake is responsible for some serious bites, okay? I mean, when I say serious, I mean life-threatening bites. This snake has the capability of a kill bite, okay? I'm gonna set him down and see if he'll sit still. There we go. See, so now let go of your rattle, he's gonna start buzzing on me. But, you know, there's a very interesting variation in timber rattlesnake venom. And now, what we have here in South Carolina, is pretty important because we have what we call a type A venom cane break. And recent studies, a lot of researchers are calling this a cane break toxin, okay? And it's because the cane breaks, or AKA timber rattlesnakes, that range from southeastern South Carolina all the way down into the 
Georgia coast and into the northern tip of Florida, they all have this type A venom. Now your type A venom is a neurotoxic component added to their venom. And they're super hot. They are smoking hot. Bites are terrible, okay? And with venom, let me tell you, you got a type A, a type B, a type C, and then your type A venom, of course, is neurotoxic. And most rattlesnakes, for many years, people believe that the type B venom was what all rattlesnakes had, which is a hemorrhagic or hemolytic, which is your venom which affects your bloodstream and things like that. Now, now, and that holds true with a lot of rattlesnakes, but not with the cane break. The cane break in certain areas had that hemolytic venom, had that hemotoxic venom, okay? But we got a vein of them that goes from South Carolina down into Florida that carries a type A venom, which is a neurotoxic venom. It makes them smoking hot, and it makes this snake right here more dangerous, okay? It makes this guy very dangerous. A bite from a cane break is serious, okay? And that can be a kill bite if you're not treated properly and in time with any venom. So to all you guys, the hunters and the first responders, everybody that comes in contact with snakes like on a regular basis, think about that, okay? When you see that timber rattlesnake, and if you have a mistake, that could be your life because timber are hot. It's a very, very venomous snake, especially the ones we have here in the southeast corner of South Carolina and Georgia and the northern tip of Florida. But other areas have found this type A venom in cane breaks also. There are some spots in Texas that have it. There are some spots in Louisiana that have it. They're finding it more and more. And they're also finding this type A that's just popping up in other species of snakes. And even with your Mojave rattlesnake, which has always been a type A venom, let me tell you something. They're finding other components in different Mojaves from different areas, different geographical ranges that are containing other kinds of peptides and enzymes that are making the venom different. And I believe it's from geographical range. I, I, I truly think that it's got something to do with prey source and weather conditions. It's just evolution. Venom is moving fast with evolution. Animals are becoming resistant against it, so snakes are up in their game and they're getting hotter so they can knock down prey quicker. And you know what's even more interesting is that in certain areas, there are some cane breaks that are type A and type B. They're not only a hemorrhagic venom, which is a hemotoxic enzyme, they're also type A. They got both. So, I mean, it's crazy how evolution is taking place with these animals. Not only with, 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 with the timber rattlesnake, also with the eastern diamondback. You know, our southern portions of, 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 of EDBs, like from South Florida, they're finding that they have a different enzyme than the ones from up north, the northern portions where, where eastern diamondbacks are, are, are prevalent. I mean, they're finding a different metal of proteins, a different peptide in that venom that makes the northern portions of eastern diamondback more venomous. So to make any venom, we need animals from all ranges to make any venom effective. So you may get bit by a damn cane break that is from the coastal Georgia area and any venom is made from cane breaks from say North Carolina or upstate South Carolina, it may not work <laughs> because the snake you've been bit by has a different peptide, has a different venom composition than what they created the antivenom from. So that's why it's important to get animals from all ranges so the antivenom is effective. So, you know, when it comes to venom for, for your South Carolina native venomous snakes, this guy is a serious player. Depending on what part of South Carolina you're living in, it could be worse than other parts. Um, a little bit about the snake itself. You know, these snakes can inhabit a lot of different habitats. They tend to favor um, borders. I call it the, the seams of things, you know, where, where they can get into a, a, a wooded area where they're accessible to a field or, or some open area for thermal regulation. But, I mean, marshes, swamps, um, wooded hillsides, I mean, rocky outcrops for the true timbers. I mean, these guys are pretty damn 
spread out. They, they can adapt to a lot of different habitat. But here in South Carolina, I mean, these guys often inhabit, you know, agricultural areas. So, you know, farmers and different, um, you know, agricultural workers will come in contact with rattlesnakes from time to time. But also, this snake is what we call a live bearer, okay? The snake has live young. And these snakes will breed in the spring and fall months. And if they breed in the fall, they usually have their babies the following year. If they breed in the spring, they usually have their babies to let go of them. So they usually have babies late that fall, but they can have anywhere from 10 to 25 babies, and the babies are, all right, dude, I'm gonna grab that rattle and shut you up there in a second. There we go. <laughs> and the babies are anywhere from 10 to 12 inches long, and they're born with just one little button, and they won't actually have a true rattle until their first shed, which usually happens about a week after birth. And then they'll have a second button. Every time a rattlesnake sheds his skin, he'll add a segment to his rattle. You can't tell the age of a rattlesnake by counting the segments of rattle, okay? That's, that's an old wives tale. But anyways, prolific snake, adults may have babies every two to three years, but they can have big broods, okay? But the canebrake rattlesnake. I mean, this is this, this is an American icon. Okay, um, the Gatling flat, you know, depicts the canebrake rattlesnake on it. With "Don't tread on me." This was almost our national animal, and I believe it should have been. You know, but these snakes are not as. I mean, I think these snakes should should enjoy protection. I mean, there are some states where it's still legal to to hunt these things, kill them, and skin them, and eat them, and all that stuff, but. I'll tell you, um, for my many years of, 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 of herping in the field, I mean, I used to be able to go out on a weekend and find 15, 20 cane breaks, timber rattlesnakes, and it was nothing. Now, you're lucky if you see three or four. I mean, so, and it's, it, it's from habitat destruction. I mean, it's not from over-collecting and, and, and all the nonsense. It, it's, it's putting roadways in every, everywhere. I mean through national parks and all that stuff. I mean, I see so many of them dead on a road, you know, that it's, you know, you, you just wonder, you know, well, is it because that road's there or, or is it because of climate change? <laughs> you know what I mean? But honestly, um, they don't mature. They're not sexually mature until they're anywhere from five to seven years old. And your northern timbers, which I call them the true mountain timbers, you know, they don't mature until they're nine, 10 years old, you know? So it's an important snake. And we need to protect this animal. Definitely need to protect this animal. And we need to protect each other. Let's educate each other about these fascinating animals, you know. But let me tell you, that is one of my favorite snakes of all time. I love cane breaks. And we used to breed them. We used to, we used to keep a lot of them. But um, now this guy is, is just an educational tool, you know, so to be an ambassador for his species, you know. But what a beautiful animal, right? And I got to keep hold of his rattle so I can talk because he'll mess up the camera sound. <laughs> but the canebrake rattlesnake, AKA timber rattlesnake, snake number one of South Carolina's six venomous snakes. So just a quick look at species number one spotlight of South Carolina's six venomous snakes, the timber rattlesnake. I believe that the timber rattlesnake deserves protection on a national level. I mean, some areas are still pretty plentiful. Some areas, you just don't see them no more. They're disappearing from the wild. And you know, the ecosystem, it's a whole system of checks and balances. When you knock something out of the equation, things go off, you know what I mean? And here's an interesting fact. You realize that one timber rattlesnake consumes thousands of ticks per year on their prey sources, on things that they eat. And you know, ticks carry Lyme disease. They carry all kinds of stuff that transmits to humans. So. Snakes, if you love them or hate them, we need the timber rattlesnake. So, and for me, it's, it's I love timber rattlesnakes. It's a cool animal, right? But anyways, what do you think about the, the downstairs, the whole exhibit room? That's gonna be awesome, right? We cannot wait to get open. We are working so hard towards our goal and we wanna thank everybody that's helped us get this far. So, if you're new to the channel, Hit that V logo thing and subscribe now and come on back to Venom Central and find out what's happening at the Serpent Center coming soon. This is Willie. We're checking out. Later.